pleasure to be back. And uh, I imagine that for some, for some of you, at least, I am now a familiar voice. Uh, and um, you also, because you've heard me before, you know that I like to work in a spiral. And what that means is that we're going to take another tour of the land, so to speak, the wonderland that is that of Jane Austen's writing and uh, the wonderland also that it is to actually understand and learn about how rich and how relevant um, her work still is. And uh, today we're going to um, do more work with the text, um, as I know that next time we will be coming back to some of the broader themes. Uh, but in fact, when I make a distinction between themes and text, that's actually artificial. What I have tried to do is to bring us all as close as we can to what I think is the absolute genius of uh, Jane Austen's writing, and particularly in these two late and in fact quite taxing and difficult books and um, you will recognize in what I offer some of my preoccupations I'll be talking about language I'll be talking about theatricality uh, but what I will do also is give you moments when I actually linger on a slide for quite a moment just because I want to do some um, probing into what is actually on display for you so for example in this case um, you notice that we have very meaningfully the writings of Jane Austen on one side and then at the same time two quotes and, and a title um, that I hope to will be very soon become clear. Um, so what I'm after today is really um, a continuation of the study of the brilliant designs that are those of her work and with a particular challenge which consists in trying to pierce into the secrets of her skills as a romantic writer, or rather, as I should say, as a romancer. And what we're going to do is try and come closer than ever to the tapestry of her work. And our centerpiece, I can already announce it today, even though persuasion is at the back of my mind all the time, our centerpiece is going to be Emma, which she began in uh, the 21st of January 1814 and finished rather quickly, in fact, uh, a little over a year later. Uh, and that suggests actually sustained, intense, maybe even feverish work in what was actually, paradoxically for her, a period of respite. And as she was staying in London, uh, an opportunity to actually visit the theater and to have more of a social life. But the paradox is really that in order to do sustained and intense work, she had to be able to abstract herself from that wor world of uh, other you know, externalities, but at the same time that she was able to still enjoy what was happening around her, that in between externalities and internalities, so to speak, is really meaningful here. So two late novels here, Emma and Persuasion, with a central concern, which is how does she do the romance? How do you do a romance? Um, it's all, all the more challenging when we look at this work that, in fact, um, if you consider uh, the amount of detail in her text, you could actually say that this work, Emma particularly, is overbrimming with the nitty gritty of a, a double realism, of a realism that registers that outside world and of psychological constructions. And I will talk more than ever today about the psychology of the characters, but also the general psychology of the novel that um, Jane Austen offers us uh, with Emma. So a romantic streak in a work that is actually in search of a new kind of realism that, for example, going back to a theme that we've already treated, a new kind of realism that depends partly on introspection and free indirect discourse. But let me start with a very simple, seemingly banal example to just say to you, see what happens when you put your nose very close to the text. And I'll take that moment, actually this time um, from um, a, the mid, about two thirds, let's say, or a bit more even, in um, uh, Emma, when Knightley writes 
to the rain, and that's on page 348, nightly right through the rain, upon understanding that he doesn't have a rival in Frank Churchill, but just to see how this sweetest and best of all creatures, faultless in spite of all her faults, bore the discovery. I read this, the quote again. Hmm? Upon understanding what he doesn't, that he doesn't have a rival in Frank Churchill, Knightley rides through the rain to see how the sweetest and best of all creatures, faultless in spite of all her faults, bore the discovery. Well, what's at stake in a passage like that? How does riding in the rain connect to values? What to make of the kindness, gallantry, generosity of a Mr. Knightley with regards to a heroine who blithely and stubbornly disregards the signs of his affection? These are just a few words to begin a kind of conversation about the text, though we won't start the conversation here, because I want to shift to a moment that is particularly interesting to me because it stages for us something that is central to the way in which Emma works, namely a moment that has to do with exchanges between a man and a woman, communications that have to do uh, with the very question that we've been looking at for a while now, which is that of how do men and women communicate in a world as loaded as this is in Jane Austen with the complications of communication. So here um, we have in fact a juxtaposition that matches the moment of recognition of saying I know I am in love which puts in a parallel situation what did she say just what she ought, of course, a lady always does. And on the other hand, the words that can only be attributed to Knightley, which are then with the gladness which he must be felt, nay, which he did not scruple to feel, having never believed Frank Churchill to be at all deserving Emma, was there so much fond solicitude, so much anxiety for her that he could stay no longer. Now, I read this as well as I could. And when I say this, I mean the thoughts that are racing through the mind of the man who is now understood that, in fact, after waiting for so long, the woman who he's been trying to woo and the woman he's been trying to convince that what's happening in her head is all too complicated and all too distant from reality, that her matchmaking is, is a dream and that she spends far too much time, in fact, in her fevered mind, drafting of plans for other people's weddings and marriages and love interests uh, to actually think of herself and understand what her own feelings are. And in fact, uh, the word uh, of my title, fever, is a word that I found in that, on that very page when we hear the inner thoughts of Mr. Knightley. As long as Mr. Knightley remained with them, Emma's fever continued. Now, something decisive has happened here. The fever, that was the fever of uh, boredom and frustration and just an overfilled imagination, that fever has suddenly moved to another space where the fever that Emma feels is actually the fever, clearly, of a woman being in love. The word is symptomatic, you could say, of her heady excitement as a woman in love. And this is uh, where I want us to linger a bit longer. And I want us to linger a bit longer because what seemed to be 
in a way, small points um, that pick up from the vast tapestry of uh, Austin's writing, small fragments, invite us to these fragments, invites us to look at style, but in fact, at questions that are much more interesting, as I will try to convince you throughout this talk, but also just in a moment. Let me just say what I mean by style. I mean, if you look again, or if you look at that quote that is on your screen as a part of my PowerPoint, you notice that there's all in those words put on Jane Austen's text, um, there is a gobbling of meaning. There is a suspension of uh, all logical articulation of thought. And yet, we can't but help but feel that we've come closer than ever to what Knightley is actually feeling. Then with a gladness which must be felt, nay, which he did not scruple to feel, and here you hear him hesitate, can he actually begin to feel as strongly as he does that he loves this woman? Can he actually almost say what, that he never believed that Frank Churchill was deserving of him. Of course, he never believed it. He knew, he knew, but he was not vain. He didn't want to prom promise and say to himself that he was better than that man. Knightley wouldn't be who he is if he didn't take a very careful, distant view of himself as he does of his rival. But, but, the first thought, and that's amazing to me in terms of the psychology of the novel, the first thought that he has is that kind thought, that kind thought that he was anxious for her. How do we, would she actually understand and accept that the man, Frank Churchill, that she ever had thought could be the man she loved, would be actually the man who uh, was marrying somebody else. The news must have been a shock. And what's amazing, as you hear me, I hope, is how much interpolating I'm actually doing, how, much, how many more words I'm adding just to make sense of that nearly cryptic moment where we go as deep as we can, so to speak, into nightly soul. We're gonna look into his soul a few more times, but this one, struck me as astounding. And it struck me as astounding also as I you know, go back to a question that Laura prompted us to examine, that question about, about someone's train of thought, about what soliloquy does in literature. Well, you can't even decide, I think, here if Mr. Knightley is in a soliloquy or if he is, in fact, talking to us readers and bearing his soul as if he was on, the st on stage. But what is clear, meanwhile, is that the words are heard and that they create, and I'm still quoting from the text, Austin's text, an exquisite flutter of happiness. And I come back to this because that exquisite flutter of happiness that goes with having a conversation between a grown-up man, she's finally grown up, our, our naive heroine, and a grown-up a grown-up woman and a grown-up man, that that conversation is really what I was trying to talk to you about very early on in the course already when I talked about Habermas's idea that there came a moment when it became possible to enter into freer conversations, freer conversations that were founded on a form of civility and on a form of communicative action, that's a learned word to just say talking, that that community um, action of talking and that the conversation sounded on civility is what actually enables not only a major revolution in the political and the social sphere, but in fact, what enables maybe a revolution in the very way in which we start thinking about how men and women live together in the world and how we think about the intercourse between the sexes at a time when we are indeed able to imagine free speech, that's what Habermas says, 
but also at a time when there are highly complex rules and prohibitions on that art of communication that is the free flowing exchange between a man and a woman. And to, if we look for free flowing exchanges between a man and a woman in Austin's novels, that is in Emma as well as in Persuasion, we see how much work it takes to get there, but we enjoy it tremendously when it happens. One of the sources that I read and reread on this question, I already mentioned him, is Tony Tanner. Tony Tanner says that persuasion in particular, and we'll dwell on that more last next time, raises the whole problem of communication between man and woman. And he also adds, and I give you that as an extra piece of wisdom, that one of the reasons is that if you look at the uh, actual context and realities, the existential elements of a woman and a man's life in the world of a Jane Austen novel, what you learn is that there are constant obstacles to that form of communication. Here I quote Tanner. The obstacle, effectively a double bind, seems to be that you cannot speak openly and directly about such important matters as your feelings of love to the person you love until you have achieved a certain intimacy tantamount to the engagement, which then permits you to talk. One could dwell and linger on this because one of the questions that I've asked myself and for which I have no answer is actually, is there a proper engagement between uh, Emma and Mr. Knightley? I'm not sure there is. Certainly not one that seems to have been discussed amply by family and celebrated uh, in the form of some kind of major symbolic event that usually goes with uh, engagements. What we do know is that there's a lot of worry about engagements when in fact, compared to that formal exchange of words between George Knight and Emma, you actually look at the concerns that are very serious concerns in this novel about that secret engagement that has bound two major figures, namely Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill in ways that uh, are so secretive as to demand decoding throughout the novel. Emma, we understand, has to learn how to sift through her feelings. And one of the places that I would like to take you to is actually at to the very beginning of chapter 31, where I will just prompt your memory, and you can always go back to it, to see how Emma herself tries to make sense of her experience of being in love and fails miserably as she actually misdirects her attention and her analytical skills and her rational thinking about making the right uh, commitment to a man in thinking about. Frank Churchill. Emma continued to entertain no doubt of her being in love. Her ideas only worried as to how much. At first, she thought it was a good deal, and afterwards, but a little. She had great pleasure in hearing Frank Churchill talked of, and for his sake, greater pleasure than ever in seeing Mr. and Mrs. Weston. She was very often thinking of him and quite impatient for a letter, that she might know how he was, how were his spirits, how was his aunt, uh, what was his chance of his coming to Randall's again in the spring. But on the other hand, she could not admit herself to be unhappy, nor after the first morning, to be less disposed for employment than usual. She was still busy and cheerful, and pleasing as he was, she could not yet imagine him to have faults. And further, though thinking of him so much, and as she sat drawing or working, forming a thousand amusing schemes for her progress and close to their attachment, fancying interesting dialogues and inventing elegant letters, 
the conclusion of every imaginary declaration on his side was that she refused him. I can't think of a better example, actually, of the kind of feverish mental activity devolved on uh, what are imaginary fantasy constructions of what she actually feels than this particular example. And I can also not imagine a funnier way for Austin herself to ironically place in her novel somebody who is almost like her alter ego, somebody who has as one genuine and wonderful capacity the richness of imagination to generate plots and after plots of um, falling in love and of fantasizing and imagining what it could be like to be uh, experiencing that feeling. Now, I move at this point to my second rubric, which has to do with the fact that it's not enough, it's not enough to uh, think of Austin as somebody who is going deep into words and uses language to try and prompt us to uh, imagine the life of her characters and imagine what it's like to be in love. The theater is important as well. And here, uh, my source is the brilliant work of somebody called Peter Brooks, who wrote a book called The Melodramatic Imagination, which uh, was a groundbreaking study into the role played in the theater in the 19th century imagination. Now, the book that Peter Brooks writes begins at a later period than Jane Austen. In fact, it's mostly drawn towards Henry James and Balzac before him. But what it says basically is that one cannot experience the 19th century novel without understanding that a lot of its uh, excitement as well as a lot of its intelligence depends on moments that stage in crucial scenes, emotions and choices as well as drama that is directly connected to what was seen on stage. And I did mention in passing at some point that Jane Austen loved the theater. We know, in fact, that when she was working on Emma, she went to the theater to see Shakespeare. She watched uh, Shylock on stage. We know that Shylock being played on stage, forgive me. She was obviously refining what you could almost call a kind of scenic method where she imagined that the best way of getting a reader into the inner world of a character is to use language in a very astute way to create scenes that are centrally meaningful and revelatory in a way of what is at the core of the books that she's writing. And here, just to say, what's at the core is not only love, it is actually also an education, a learning that has to do with rationality, with being reasonable, with taking a distance from action. It's a form of learning, of course, that is totally familiar to us. You wouldn't be in this course if you didn't read books. And it's when we read books that we actually take a distance from things, that we actually parse and analyze and get into fictional experiences when we read novels, fictional experiences indeed, but we lose ourselves in those experiences. And from that, we learn something that can be absolutely central to, one might even say, to our moral education. Now, as I'm making uh, these comments, I have in mind um, research that I did myself, collaborations, and uh, just my own enthusiasm about work that has been done maybe over the last 10, 15 years, one could say, in the area of 
reading and the study of reading. And I, I will just give you a few references. And as we're talking about preparing a later um, document for you, that will be a kind of set of suggested readings. I will make sure to put these references in. So don't worry if you don't catch them all. But, but to say what I'm affirming here, I have looked at books that study the science of reading. For example, books that feature the very advanced cognitive achievements of a reading brain. I'm thinking the, of the brilliant book by Stanislas Dehaene called Reading in the Brain. I'm thinking also of work done at Tufts by a wonderful uh, psychologist and a specialist of reading called Proust and the Squid. I am thinking also of other work by uh, a very talented scholar called Lisa Sunshine, with whom I've had the pleasure of collaborating at times, who six or seven years ago decided that it should be possible to study on the basis of style and complexities of style, the way in which a complex syntax enables us to enter into others' minds and to actually share others' point of views. Now, some of you may know that in the philosophy of mind, the whole question of other minds is, is a burning issue. But what's amazing here for me, when I reread Jane Austen in light of um, the uh, course I'm giving, but also in light of uh, my amazement at how skilled she is at getting us to read closely, What's amazing to me is that, that Austin actually knows this. She knows, for example, as she uh, tells us via Mr. Knightley, that one of the problems with uh, Emma is that instead of actually reading books, she spends most of her time thinking about reading books, possibly even talking about books, and especially arranging them neatly in her book, in her, in her home, but says in his teasing way, Mr. George Knightley, Emma had been meaning to read ever since she was 12 years old. Uh, if only Emma had read more, maybe she would have avoided all the mistakes that she started making when she uh, invested in uh, an imagination that feverish as it was, made her script her own novels. And um, as I say this, of course, I, I am above all uh, taking you back to that place where we have with Jane Austen, a writer who is capable herself of recognizing that if you want to talk in a grown up fashion, in a rational fashion about the ways of loving, then you have to make sure that you get your readers deep into the nuances of thought that only the art of good writing can produce. What you do when you do that, on the other hand, is that you, next slide, what you um, do is that you draw on a culture that precedes you. Among the most um, interesting readings I had the chance of uh, doing when I was working on the question of women and writing it is a book by an Italian scholar called Benedetta Craveri that I read with fascination as I was trying to understand a genealogy, so to speak, of the psychological novel. And that what I found in that book and that what is represented emblematically for you in this slide is a culture of women talking to women in a, what looked like a kind of socializing mission that could happen in a culture of the drawing room, as they were called in the salon of the 17th of the 18th century. I saw a culture of women who were visiting each other, creating cycles and circles of conversation that were decisive, I believe, in creating the conditions for new forms of gallantry, of politeness, of refined intercourse, 
that we owe to them because we would have no trace of their conversations, but because some of them chose to be writers. So imagine this fascinating moment in culture when learned women, intelligent women with greater freedom uh, than the average woman at the court, usually widows or often also women of the lower rungs of the aristocracy, that these women spent their pastime, their leisure, but also their um, freedom, so to speak, in ways of exploring what it would be like to map a new kind of relations between the sexes. And they did that in their conversations that happened in the vernacular without references to any of the classical sources or with just a nod to them, keen as they were in finding a vocabulary that would actually enable you to chart the road of feelings, the road towards feelings. And here I move to the next slide, which is one that we will definitely come back to next time, but I want to tease you with it. In a way, teasing is the right word because uh, I'm showing you on this screen a, an image of printed on silk, an image of a map that had a tremendous circulation in the 17th century when it was devised by a writer. And if you want to know more about the writer, all you need to do is click the link that I'm giving you here. Mademoiselle de Scudery is her name. Here is a map that had as a central goal the aim of guiding a woman through the complex path that might lead her to fall in love with the right man. It seems that this is actually the right place to make a transition to another moment that is related to last time's discussion. And this time I'm uh, thinking of um, the questions that uh, Patricia was raising the questions that have to do with uh, degrees of separation. A woman who would like to marry faces an amazing number of degrees of separation when it comes to coming close to her, the object of her desire. Now, this is a question that we will look at more closely in a moment, but for the time being, let's look at it with a kind of distant historical view that uh, I think befits the, the weight of that question. Why is it so hard for women to come into a purview or circle where they can actually connect with others in ways that are meaningful for them? And when I say meaningful for them, I don't only mean meaningful in terms of what you see on the left side of the slide, namely the opportunity, ironized, satirized here, you know, an amazing image called the comforts of bath, where uh, you are comforted in uh, the pains that might be pains of the heart or pains of the body by the fact that you can actually meet somebody in that melting pot that is the city of bath. Uh, that's you know, the almost comedic version of uh, what uh, Austin is offering us. But let's look on the other side at the arrival at Bath again. Let's look at the other side of the coin, namely the way in which what might separate you from uh, finding a meaningful life might be the way in which you're cut off, you're prevented from engaging with a world that is filled with uh, opportunities for doing good things, that is filled also with opportunities to uh, come closer to uh, what is happening outside of the home, outside of domesticity. But you are, if you happen to be a lady in that carriage on the right, so protected, you need so much sheltering that the freedom 
is taken away from you. So this is, you could say, a quick dipping into the geography almost of, of the world of uh, uh, Austin's novels and of the degrees of separation that stand between you and, and being happy and being fulfilled and doing something that's meaningful. Um, needless to say, because this has been studied a lot, I can say needless to say, uh, part of what one could look at here as historians and social historians would be to scan the amazingly complex nuances of social placement and economic resources and of possessions in terms of land that define the existence of the heroes and especially the heroines who are actually entrapped, uh, the, the, the existential conditions that define what is possible by way of freedom for a moment. There is a pecking order, the code of conduct. You have social position, property, place, family, manners, propriety, they, they all separate you. They all stand in the way. And then, and then, perhaps most central, you have this sense that as a woman, your place is inside. Your place should be, surely, in the domestic space. And that's as true of Emma as it is of Jane Elliott. It just takes very different form. I come back here to an image, that of walking. And why do I go back to this image? Because one of the things one could study in uh, Emma, as well as in persuasion, is, is how walking, walking on the estate, walking in a city, walking into a new world, into a new space, is, is an activity loaded with meanings. It is an activity, in fact, that creates some of the very meaningful scenes in the novel. Think of the moment when, uh, not in Emma, but in Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy has taken Elizabeth Bennet to see his property. Think of Emma walking on the estate that is that of Mr. Knightley. Or think of, in persuasion, think of what it means in some precious moments for Anne Elliot to be able to just take a little bit of air, taking a bit of breathing space when she walks in the street to visit her friend, Mrs. Smith. The constraints are, are many, and the constraints have to do clearly with the need for a chaperone, with the need for women to walk in groups, with the need to lean on someone's arm, something that's been greatly ironized by um, Virginia Woolf, for example, or for the need, uh, very strange as I put it, but for the need in persuasion of being gently eased into a carriage by Wentworth when he realizes that Anne is tired and looks flustered and that it might be just gallant of him to bring her into a carriage. The spectrum here of what's possible and imaginable is immense. And in fact, women writers know that. For example, George Eliot, a keen reader of women's fiction, who is written on lady novelists, gives to one of her most striking, dashing, intelligent, clever, but bored heroines, a dream which is an amazing dream. If only, if only Gwendolyn Harless in Daniel Verona could go to the East and hunt for tigers. It's as crazy as that, that dream and that need for expansion by women in the 19th century. And I believe that Austin, Austin gives us the, be the beginning of that story. Now, now, remember what we studied last time. Remember how we saw how difficult it was to actually move around, how desirable it was to travel, and how I use this coach as a kind of emblem of both mobility and the need to leave one's confinement and to open onto a bigger world. I will not dwell on this, but these references would be 
central if we delve more deeply into this notion of what defines the kind of morality and ethos that Jane Austen is proposing in her novel. An ethos that says men and women should be able to hand in hand, arm in arm, walk together and exchange good words in conversation. The origin, so to speak, uh, the genealogy for that, that idea, you find in that great Christian epic by one of the most learned and most of the sensitive minds when it came to relations between the sexes, namely John Milton in Paradise Lost. And the slide is here to give you a chance, if you wish, to read these words. There are words really about this notion called companionate marriage. Now, companionate marriage is an invention, so to speak, of a world that arises gradually in the 17th century and moves us gently and steadily, steadily into what has been called the rise of effective individualism. The rise of effective individualism. That is the rise of a time when affection for each other trumps affection, loyalty you owe to family, you owe to title, you owe to family meaning in terms of genealogy, you owe to title, and that you owe to uh, the hierarchies of the social culture. And I could think of no more moving and puzzling image for this than the one that you are looking at now. Note that these are Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, untitled. <laughs> They're not of the nobility. They are, like Mr. Knightley, like right, Mr. Darcy, somewhere in that in-between world of the gentry and the aristocracy and uh, a rising, increasingly middle-class culture where man and woman spend time together. Uh, not always, obviously. Uh, we recognize that this one of them must be on his way to a hunt, whereas she's sitting there pretty waiting for something and you know what i'm going to say of course she's probably waiting for that next moment in her life when she will be truly busy or maybe they're already that there in the back of the picture we just don't see it at home with the nanny and with the governess the children she's waiting for that other moment or that other occupation in her life now this would be you know a slide that we could talk about in very meaningful ways i think in terms of of a history of um what actually begins to uh be built in jane austen's fictional world namely an extremely acute awareness of the necessity of good marriages and good relations between the sexes, but also of gender differentials and all of all the obstacles, the degrees of separation that make it hard to actually find the right partner. But I uh, prefer for this occasion to actually bring you to a place that is, to me, a brilliant instance of how Jane Austen is capable of teasing us with uh, the idea that the most important um, aspect of uh, her writing is one that wants us to come close, as close as possible, to the world that is that of the characters that she's placed in her fiction. And for the fun of it here, I will read you a brief moment excerpted from what is the visit to uh, Downwell Abbey that is undertaken to actually uh, entertain and uh, take away from their boredom the whole crowd of inhabitants of Highbury. And here I read for you. <laughs> 
The whole party were assembled, excepting Frank Churchill, who was expected every moment from Richmond, and Mrs. Elton, in all her the characters of happiness, her large bonnet and her basket, was very ready to lead the way in gathering, accepting, or talking. Strawberries, and only strawberries, could now be thought of and spoken of. The best fruit in England, everybody's favorite, always wholesome. These, the finest best and the finest sort, delightful to gather for oneself, the only way of really enjoying them. Morning is ideally the best time, never tired, every sort good. Old boy, infinitely superior, no comparison, the others hardly eatable. Old boys, very scarce, chili preferred, white wood, finest flavor of all, price of strawberries in London, abundance about Bristol, maple grove, cultivation beds when to be renewed, gardeners thinking exactly differently, no general room, gardeners never to be put out of their way, delicious fruit, only too rich to be eaten too much, inferior to cherries, currants more refreshing, only objection to gathering strawberries, the stooping, glaring sun, tired to death, could bear it no longer, must go and sit in the shade. I find it very hard to read comedy. I'm not an actress. I wish we could have had an actress read this for you. But I hope you're beginning to see here with what amazing modernity Jane Austen decides to write what looks almost like to me like a surreal scene of discussion in the gossip, um, chatter, excessive talking, talking to herself, talking to others, talking to the gallery way of Mrs. Elton. Mrs. Elton, it turns out, is for me the very exemplary of a figure who, of course, um, is at the center of the comedy and the different ironies of this novel, but also maybe at the center of what turns out to be an amazing discovery, namely that before Freud himself, Austin had already invented what you could call the psychology, or rather, maybe more deeply, the theory of dreams. In his work, as he starts to reflect on how people dream, as he works on his major work called The Interpretation of Dream, Freud understands two things. He understands that dreams are always part of a wish fulfillment, but he also understands that dreams are something that uh, we repress more and more, that we keep away from our consciousness unless we happen to be as openly candid, naive, and transparent as a Mrs. Elton. When Freud observed his granddaughter, who was just about learning to talk, and he spied on her as, he was in, as she was in her cot, fond grandfather as he was, and he heard her say, strawberry, 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 strawberry. And what he knew was that child who was learning to be grown up already. We were in Vienna, we were in a culture that gave an education and um, restrictions to children quite early. That child could only in her dreams see her strawberries. Well, Mrs. Elton, like that child, can only in that semi-dream and fantasizing of her own inner speech and of her chattering, imagine that, oh, she could have been, if only she could have been, the woman on that estate with all the strawberries. It's a case of envy, you might say, and that would be how a simple psychologist would label it. But for me, it's a case of um, emphasizing for you how amazingly creative Jane Austen is in her feverish way of writing. And, and here, I show you just as a way of bringing you back to the book, huh? the ingenuity of some of the solutions that she found to her novels. 
Anthropologists usually tell us that when uh, marriage occurs, the most frequent structure is one of exogamy. You leave the family to go somewhere else. Well, in her field work, so to speak, in her attempt to understand how she could meet the two conditions of a loyal daughter and at the same time of a woman in love, Jane Austen managed to create a book where the two are conflated. And that is part of her genius. And it's you know, part of her genius to actually have built around the community as small as Highbury, hmm, a world that is as engrossing as the 400 pages of so or so of a protracted adventure that has no more and no less as a topic the question of finding a husband. And I leave to your contemplation here one of the very often quoted um, moments in um, Emma. I leave it to, to your examination as a kind of example of the kind of alter ego that. Uh, inhabits the book, namely an alter ego that has on the one hand understood that um, it's necessary for uh, the story to unfold, that we have somebody who keeps producing thoughts that have to do uh, with uh, the peculiarity and the precision of a grammarian and mathematician that has to do with imagining love. And at the same time, an alter ego who is capable of getting carried away by the plot she has imagined, that carried away enough to be able to do the romantic stuff as well. You can't be just locked in the calculation. You actually have to be able to do the romance and both at the same time is a, a drawing point that requires great ingenuity. I use this slide just as a um, reminder, so to speak, uh, of what I have been preparing my audience for, I think, for a while now, which is this idea that the novel is not only a place where one reads the, as it, it held up in a mirror to the world, the stories of character, but the novel, this novel in particular, is particularly adept at bringing you into the very activity that, in fact, defines novel making. In other words, the figure that's standing outside is looking into a mirror that is the mirror, let's say, of Harriet and Emma, for example, or Cassandra or Andrew and, and, and uh, Jane. But it is a mirror that actually says, I am able to create a romance because I am in it. I am in that fantasy and I'm able to create it. And I am able to create it with a level of detail and we'll return to this next time that even involves me in the lives and the world of children. I'm able to de describe it with a level of registration that actually understands that affairs of the heart are also affairs that have to do not only with a metaphor, but actually with the literal question of what does one do with one's heart? Not only who do you give it to, but how do you, do you show care for the others? How do you show that you worry about somebody's sore throat? How do you show that you worry about? Well, we have here in the figure of Mr. Woodhouse, the valedictorian, you have a figure of uh, the person who is ill. But we also have, of course, in this novel, the most striking and perhaps moving example uh, in this, uh, forgive me, in this slide, the most striking and moving example, perhaps, of a romantic mood. And here we have just a few seconds to give you, but we're going to give you just a little bit of a musical impression. <laughs> 
betrayed you a melody that seems to come across as a faint sound, maybe as a memory. But above all, we played you a memory that I choose because I want to prepare for next time what is a transition to a different mood, to a mood that is much more introspective, to a mood that is much more that of the romance of memory, and to a mood that I think is beautifully captured in some of the interpretations, and I give you a modern one by way of a link, you can listen to it privately, uh, a mood that is that of women addressing to uh, the, the world, so to speak, a, the, the, the tonality of their souls. Um, the slide that you see here, very revealing, I think, is that of, of that looking outwards of a woman confined in the domestic space. It is a slide that, it is an image that connects us to persuasion. And it is also an image that I want to offer for contrast when I invite you to look again, to look with fresh eyes at the amazing thing that happens at the very end of our novel, the denouement. The denouement when um, you hear words that you never thought you would hear in this book. Words such as, my dearest, my most beloved Emma. If I loved you less, I might be able to talk about it more. And adding to the irony of that, the voice of Emma saying to herself, that she hears these words in a tone that is such sincere, so filled with sincere, decided, and intelligible tenderness, as it was tolerably convincing. Tolerably convincing is a level of, of irony that uh, takes great art. Tolerably con convincing says, even in that moment, do not lose sight, dear reader, of the way in which our now finally intelligent heroine is trying to measure in her cleverness and intelligence and her new maturity whether this is going too far or whether this is tolerable and acceptable. And the words that uh, are pronounced are, of course, the words of a yes, which you have already heard. And what you hear at the end are Knightley's words. Emma, I accept your offer. Extraordinary as it may seem, I accept it and refer myself to you as a friend. Tell me then, I have, I have no chance ever of succeeding. He stopped in his earnest text to look at the question and the expression of his eyes overpowered her. The expression of his eyes overpowered her is probably the most interesting and maybe most meaningful uh, few words one can collect in this ending to actually understand the subtlety and the intelligence with which Jane Austen wraps up this story. She wraps it up, she wraps it up with the acknowledgement that the woman that she is, Emma, is actually overpowered by what she sees in the eyes of the man she loves. And I leave you, I leave us with that question. Is it then the case that Jane Austen, in Jane Austen, sex is essentially gender? Thank you.